Hello everyone. Welcome to the Philosophical Beginnings, Matter, Motion and the Cosmos course. As the name suggests, in this course, we'll be going to the beginnings of philosophy, well, specifically Greek philosophy. Uh, why Greek philosophy, we'll discuss in a bit. But what we're going to be looking at is basically a, a brand of thought that started in around 6th century BC in, in and around Greece. So we can't say Greece because now in modern day it would be parts of Turkey and Italy and Greece. So we are, we are, we're going to be looking at the Mediterranean region. So think of it that way. And we're going to be looking at um, the beginning of a particular brand of thought, as I just said, which later took the name of philosophy in the West. Right? In this, in this brand of thought, what is going on is that um, the, the thinkers involved that we will talk about were dedicated to finding um, the, the, the sort of answers to a lot of questions um, in a, in a philosophical and rational uh, sort of, with, with philosophical and rational explanations. So they were dedicated to finding the origins of the world, its constituents, its structure, its alterations. So, you know, like they had all these questions about, you know, where, how did the world come about? What are its constituents? What is it, i.e., what is it made of? Uh, what is its structure? Uh, how does it change? Uh, what remains the same and what changes? What are the reasons of change, right? So all these questions. And um, what distinguished them, because it's not like they were the first people to ask these questions, but what distinguished them was this um, immense desire, like, you know, a kind of, uh, 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 it, we could call it a desire, but it was also a sort of methodology that they tried to develop in which they wanted to use observation, and, you know, in, in some way, you know, an, an empiricist attitude, like what they see around them and reason, logic, uh, rather than turning to tradition and myth. So, you know, um, if somebody asked, OK, so uh, why is there thunder and lightning? So instead of like going to tradition and myth, which also had answers to this, and uh, we, we will discuss how those answers were proto-philosophical in many ways. Um, so instead of sort of saying, oh, it's because, um, you know, Zeus was, I don't know, got angry or, you know, um, Zeus was thinking of um, showing off uh, in, in his power or something. Um, the answer that they would try to come up with would be, oh, maybe it has something to do with clouds and rain and wind. You know, I, I mean, they might have come up with very naive explanations, very simple explanations, but, but nevertheless, they did try to come up with certain explanations which would uh, which sort of turn to nature and observation of nature rather than towards, you know, um, a myth and storytelling and, you know, so which, which are beautiful but may not be the sort of, you know, um, may not be explanations that would always work, right? So um, these philosophers, whom we call philosophers, were also uh, counted as the first scientists. You know, we, we think of them as the first scientists. So we will also discuss in this course, um, you know, what, what was it to be a scientist? I mean, they were not scientists in the modern sense of the term. So you are all science students. Well, not all, but most of you are science students here in this course. And um, uh, when, you, when we discuss the, you know, scientific attitude of these people, you might not find that much in common necessarily with some of the work that you're doing in your labs. But at the same time, you will find uh, a lot that you could relate to, you know, because some of the questions, you know, some of the general questions, which, you know, why are you doing science? You know, what, what leads you to make these decisions? So some of the general questions, you know, nevertheless remain the same. So uh, we will discuss, we will talk about, you know, what these questions were and what kind of answers they came up with. And one thing that, you know, you would also realize is that they were actually pretty brilliant given the lack of, um, well, you know, experiment and the infrastructure for experiment that they had. They, uh, so it, it is also, this course is a history of, I mean, you could think of it as a history of philosophy or a history of science, but it's a history of ideas. It's about the development of ideas. It's about the formation of theories. It's about um, a, a development of a scientific sort of methodology in some ways, you know? Um, I mean, as I said, you would not find it exactly like, you know, modern scientific methodology that you use, but, 
it was a development of a scientific attitude. Uh, and you can, you can trace it back to this time, to 6th century BC. So we'll look at that as well. Uh, the course title, as you notice, it's not just philosophical beginnings, but it's also matter, motion, and the cosmos. So why these three words? Well, we're going to be focusing, and I'll discuss this a bit more as well in you know, one of the later videos. Uh, but what, what we had at that time, you know, so the three things that were really central questions for these early thinkers were one, one was matter in, in the sense of, you know, like the, the material world that we have around us with, with air and water and leaves and trees and, um, you know, soil and, you know, all these things. So, so uh, what constitutes matter? You know, it's, it's, it is a philosophical question. And it, in fact, it's a question that goes beyond mere sort of, you know, there is fire, but it's like, what is fire? Not that, you know, I can use fire to cook, but what use can fire be to me? You know, or rather, rather not what use can fire be to me, but what is fire made of? Why is fire hot? Why does fire go out if I put water on it? So what is the relationship between, you know, two different aspects of matter? Is there an original matter? So these were the kind of questions that were asked by the, the, the early philosophers. So we'll be, we'll be looking at uh, sort of and, and so motion was another question, sorry, you know, before I, before I skip. So motion was another question in the sense that, you know, why is there movement? How is there movement, you know? And, and uh, motion is something that is actually one of the trickiest part of um, things to explain because um, often enough, you know, the idea was that things would move because there is something that can move them. Yeah. So if you're starting to think of like, um, uh, okay, so why does, for example, a river flows, right? How, how does it flow? Why does that water move? You know, what is moving it? What causes it to move? Is there anything that originally pushed it to move at the very least? You know, so all these questions. So, so the question of motion was also pretty central. And if they're not turning to myth and religion, and if they're not turning to um, explaining motion via Zeus or, you know, or any other god, then how do you explain motion? And finally, you know, all these questions uh, get together in the question of the structure of the universe, right? So the structure, the formation, the genesis, if we are going to think of genesis at all, um, the, the sort of the way things are arranged, like what causes order in this universe? Because the universe, the ancients observed, you know, you, you can observe the universe and it might look like completely chaotic and confusing. But um, you would also, once you start thinking about it, observe that there are certain patterns, you know, there are certain there's a certain structure, there's a certain order to things. Uh, you have, you know, um, you have an alteration of seasons, you have the alterations of day and night, you have the movement of stars. You know, so th there is a certain structure to be observed. And so the third question that they had was that, is there a cosmos? Cosmos, the word itself means order or structure. It also means beauty. It means, or rather beauty or uh, not beauty, but beautiful ornament. You know, it's a beautiful order. Cosmos means beautiful order, which means that there is some kind of a structure to it that can be observed. So one of the sort of central questions for the ancients was um, cosmos, right? W what is this universe, is the world that we observe around us ordered in a particular way? Is there a cosmos? And that's where the word from cosmos, you have cosmology, so that which is a study of order or the discourse, the, the you know, the, the, a, a narrative about order, if you want to think of it that way. So um, in this course, uh, we'll be looking at um, multiple sort of original sources, actually, and we'll talk about the sources in, you know, the next video. We'll be looking at uh, multiple original sources, but in, in translation, because, you know, um, in, the, in this class, there, there are not, um, there are no sort of Greek readers. Um, but we'll be looking at, um, from, well, well, we'll start with a pre philosophical world. So we'll first look at, you know, what kind of um, what kind of explanations, because people still ask these questions about order and structure. So we'll be looking at first uh, before the pre-Socratics, uh, as we call them, you know, the philosophers before Socrates. Um, and I'll explain that as well, sorry. Uh, so we'll be looking at uh, Homer and Hesiod and, you know, ancient mythology and religion, Greek mythology and religion, and the kind of explanations they came up with.
it, and which of them were actually proto-cosmological in some ways, um, which, which, because they were cosmological, they were also trying to explain order in a particular way. They were just not um, doing it via necessarily via naturalistic means. But you know, how, how does that also work as a sort of natural philosophy, you know, there, there are, I mean, it's, it's not a clear cut division that, you know, um, Thales of Miletus came up and then he said, well, let there be science, you know, it, it, it didn't work that way. So you have um, proto scientific elements before him and after and in Thales himself, you have sort of um, mythological elements. So, you know, there is, there is a, there's no clear cut division that we can make. So we'll be looking at people before him. Then we'll look at the Milesians who were um, from the coast of Turkey, the Western coast of Turkey, that is. Uh, and well, there's no Eastern coast as far as I know. Um, so from the Western coast of Turkey, you have the town of Miletus from where you have Thales, an Aximander and an Aximenes. Um, so we'll be looking at um, their original theories of you know, matter and motion and from, from fragments. Then we'll go from there. We will look at Xenophanes of Colophon, Heraclitus of Ephesus. Uh, and I'll, I'll share a map on, on Classroom. Um, then, uh, then we will look at, well, the Italian shore, really. So we will come to Pythagoras, who was of Samos. But you know, like, he, would, he was in Croton when he was um, working out a lot. I mean, his school was there. So we will be looking at Pythagoras and then um, we'll be, then we will look at what I like to call the dynamite of ancient philosophy, which is Parmenides, who, you know, um, got everybody sort of moving. Actually, you know, before Parmenides, we'll look at, oh, I already mentioned Heraclitus. So we will look at Heraclitus, who is um, probably one of the most interesting, you know, all of them are interesting, but you know, I, I really have a soft spot for Heraclitus. Uh, then we'll look at, um, as I said, Parmenides and Zeno. You've heard of Zeno, of course, I'm sure, through Zeno's paradoxes. Um, we'll look at some of the later Pythagoreans as well to see, you know, like the, you know, things like number atomism. To go to the pluralists who were trying to answer the challenge of Parmenides, which we will discuss when we discuss Parmenides, which are Empedocles and Anaxagoras. To arrive finally, and so our destination, if you want to think of it as a train journey or any journey that is taking us somewhere, so our destination is to come to the Atomist. So we will arrive at the ancient Atomist, which is uh, Leucippus and Democritus of Abdera. And, the, uh, and what kind of things led to ancient atomism, what constituted in ancient atomism, what kind of theories they came up with. So that's the trajectory that we are going to take in this course. Right, and our theme is throughout going to be matter, motion, cosmos, but we're going to also look at, you know, a lot of other things around as sort of it suits us. So we'll look at some of the history, some of, um, some of poetry perhaps, you know, so we, we will look at that time and, and, and different sort of, you know, aspects of it. So <clears throat> what's the point of doing this course? Well, I mean, if you're interested in the history of science, history of philosophy, history of ideas, even, you know, just generally, um, this is, um, this is an interesting course to do, and it, these are these are interesting texts to look at. They're not the easiest in some ways, and it's not the, the simplest sort of way of studying because you don't have any fixed answers. You don't even have fixed ex interpretations, and as you'll find out, we don't even know if all our sources are completely trustworthy. Uh, so we will be looking at... Um, you know, different texts, different interpretations. So I'll be sharing a lot of texts by different writers. And I'll ask you to also go and look up, you know, and, 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 and it's up to you how much you want to read and how much you want to explore, of course. But I would, I would recommend, you know, if, you're, if you are interested in this course to sort of read and think and explore a lot of stuff. And um, what will you get, you know, so the learning objectives bit of this course is that um, you will, have some, you, you will develop some understanding of some of the ancient conceptions of the, uh, uh, of the origin and of the structure of the cosmos. So you will, I mean, that's the, the main element of the course. Um, you will know some of the basic figure, know about some of the basic figures uh, of the ancient period. So you might, you have probably heard of, at the very least, you have heard of Pythagoras, you know, the Pythagorean theorem. You've heard of Parmenides and Zeno, I'm sure. You might have heard of Empedocles. Um, so, and Heraclitus, some of you. So you will get to know a bit more about, you know, the ancient figures, what, you know, what was their place, how did they affect the history of philosophy, to some extent that too. Um, 
we, you will look at some of the you know central questions and methods that they use at that time and then how they have influenced the history of ideas and the history of philosophy and how these thinkers are relevant to the present age you know that's another thing that you know we will we will be discussing and we'll be sort of thinking about um, and uh, when we are looking at the beginning of philosophy we are also as i said looking at the beginning of science and we're looking at its relationship to mythology and religion so that's one thing that so so we will hopefully be able to get to a better understanding of the relationship of philosophy and history and science and politics and religion. So, you know, the, the sort of a more of a hol holistic understanding of that time might give us, you know, even analogically some understanding of our time. So, you know, I, I always hope that it does. And then uh, for those of you who are doing a philosophy course for the first time, it will um, develop your abilities to sort of identify philosophical questions. You know, what kind of philosophical questions do we have and in fact okay the methods and the interests of philosophy have shifted quite a bit and developed quite a bit but there are some things that are still the same you know interestingly so um, to it, it'll help develop the capacity to reason philosophically and uh, to think about issues of universal significance and to, to get a deeper understanding of the methods and the subject matter of philosophy. So, you know, all of these elements are definitely going to be part of, um, you know, the learning objectives of this course. Uh, what is our bibliography? So, uh, I mean, I've, I've already shared the list. I've, yeah, I mean, it's a short bibliography, even though it looks very long. Uh, we'll be looking at a variety of sources. So, uh, I mean, the uh, text that I have prescribed, you know, the, the sort of our primary text is um, Kirk Raven and Schofield's The Pre-Socratic Philosophers, but it is a very scholarly and difficult text. Um, so we will be turning to that primarily, but I will also share a lot of other texts, you know, and the more you read, the better it is. So I will not say that you have to read, if I share 10 texts and if you don't have time, you know, you can ask me even, so which ones you want to sort of, you know, uh, which ones you should focus on, but I will share a variety of texts by, you know, um, commentators, historians of philosophy, um, sometimes maybe also historians of science, uh, and, you know, a few articles, but then also, you know, a few other later texts. Um, so, yeah, do sort of, you know, um, write to me or, um, you know, put, the, put it on Classroom if you have any questions about this.